I am unashamed. What about you? So, Jace, I'm uh, down here at the Southern Lair, and la- yesterday we were watching the um, NCAA b- basketball tournament because my grandson, my oldest grandson, Corby, he loves sports. And, of course, Vinny was here as well. And so we're watching games and having a good time. And so as we get into the later hours, and the last of the tournament, I realized that I had forgotten to check Shannon Bream's She's got a show on Fox uh, that, that aired this weekend about her book. Uh, I think it's called Women of the Bible Speak. Yeah. So I turn over there and I'm checking it out because I've heard her promo the book because I like Shannon and her show. She's a very uh, godly woman. And uh, so I look in here popping in mm-hmm. like they're talking about Leah and Rachel. And here comes Missy, which I didn't even I guess I didn't even realize she was a part of the show. And uh, she did also. I mean, like her, her whole piece that she did, and she was so animated reading about it, you know. And I, I was just like, "You go, yeah. Missy." I mean, she was just doing a little, you know, a little what? Bible teaching, you know, in, in, on yeah. this thing on Fox News last night. Well, I thought it was pretty amazing. Well, here's what's crazy: when I came, I did an event last night. So when I got in, it was late. I mean, that I think that show runs like our time nine to ten, and it's nine to ten. Yeah, yeah. And so I get home last night, like right before ten. And when I walked in, you know, hey, babe, hey, babe. And then I heard her still talking. And I said, are you watching yourself on TV? And she was like, yeah, remember I told you I was on the Shannon Bream. You know, and then you have that moment of the remember I told you. And you just go along with that. I've learned that through 30 years of marriage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah how, don't say. How, how, yeah. How'd that go? So, uh and I, I agree with you, Al. It's it was fantastic. I thought anytime you get an yeah. opportunity, and I think what's funny is she was supposed to be like the real life character portrayal in the in you know in the story of I, I forget what Bible story she was talking about. Do you remember which one it was? She was doing Leah and uh, Leah and Rachel. Yeah. Uh, Jacob's wives, you know, and kind of the tension. And it, you know, it talked a little bit about like it showed some pictures of family. And she talked a little bit about, you know, that any family has tension. And so you're right. She was kind of the they had like, uh, I guess you call them celebrities, but most of them are just like yeah. really good, godly women. Um, you know, Avita King was one of them. And they have a Bible scholar on there to kind of walk you through the right. narrative. And uh, but I said, well. I guess they had two Bible scholars on there. And she was like, what do you mean? I was like, babe, you're, you know, the Bible. I mean, so yeah, it it was pretty good. I mean, look, it's with our relationship. I mean, obviously I've said many times, and I guess y'all saw that when she was on the podcast, the most nervous podcast I've done, because I had no idea where that was going, but we don't have anything in common besides Jesus. So I like these moments we can talk about. And, you know, we're in this battle trying to help our daughter. And she, our daughter is doing amazing considering what she's gone through the last couple of weeks. And so I told you, we all have our roles. You know, I'm the, I'm the water boy. I, I'm the runner. We need this. I make it happen. And there's been lots of things in this that I can't share with them because they they do things that I don't even know what they're talking about. You know, I remember in the hospital one time, Missy said, give me a Coke Zero. And I was like, what is that? She said, Coke <laughs> Zero. You'll find it. But I'm, I'm walking away like, Coke, they, they make something called a Coke Zero? And so I leave there, ask a nurse. I said, what exactly is a Coke Zero? And they're like, it's zero sugar. I said, so is it vapor? Because I thought if you take the sugar out of Coke, all you're left with is something you can snort. Like, and that that's all it is. And, of course, the nurse looked at me like I was crazy. She's like, it's in a vending machine. I was like, sure enough, here it is. So I had another one of these moments back home. So Missy says, look, Miss uh, Mia wants, if you can go get her these paint by numbers. Now, look, do y'all know what that is? Have you ever heard anything called paint by numbers? Of course not. Al? Oh, yeah, I know what it is. I have oh. grandkids that do it. So, yes, I know. 
Okay, well, me and Phil. I, I'm, I'm a little more observant than you are, just of pop culture, of soft drinks, and apparently of, you know, paint by number. Yeah, so I'm on the phone, and I'm driving from Monroe, and she's like, stop by Hobby Lobby. And, I mean, just off the top of my head, I said, do we have one of those? She said, it's <laughs> been there for 10 years. I never knew we had a Hobby Lobby. <laughs> did you know we had one, Al? <laughs> I did. Okay. In fact, it was this. This is going to shock you, Jace. It's the old Walmart. It's where Walmart used to be until well, they that, built the that, big super. That's what center. she said. She said, "How could you live in this town for this long?" <laughs> you pass by it every day. You pass yeah. by it every day. You didn't know either, Phil. <laughs> I, I don't know. know. I, I've I don't. been into one Hobby Lobby. It's the main office. Uh, the people who own it, the Greens, yep. the Greens, right? the Greens, yeah, the Greens, and they invited me over. Yep. And, and I walked in, and they showed me they had an exact replica of a, of a hobby lobby of their store, yeah, and the way it looks, and they work with it and say you do this, do that. Whoa. So I just walked in and looked around, and I I told Green, I said, I I've never uh, well, Phil, it, what's your it, it, it looked like a <laughs> woman's hangout. So yeah, gonna, okay, now, that, now that's going to help. That Maybe one reason I didn't know that they existed. So I walked in and I was shocked because I thought, how could I miss something so big? This thing is huge. I mean, I was a little nervous because I thought I'm gonna get, I could get lost in here. It's that big. <laughs> they had every so, kind of uh, the woman that was kind of giving us a tour. She said, I'm over the, you know, whatever, clothing, uh, fashion. I said, let, let me make a guess. I said, do you have any camouflage? And she no. grinned and she said, we do. Uh oh. So she takes me back in there and she had, they had a, it looked like a real Hobby Lobby because it, that's how they, they, they got a replica and they yeah. replace it and put stuff on the wall. So I looked over there. It wasn't, it sure wasn't enough, clothing. In the middle of it, all that clothing, it, she went back and there was a little rack clothing. with yeah. camouflage material. I said, well, there you go. It wasn't cl it wasn't clothing, Dad. They don't sell clothing there. It was ribbons. Ribbons, It yeah. was ribbons like for streamers and stuff. Well, and whatever. Through, you know, and then – they did find yeah. camo ribbons, which well, Dad was totally so, impressed. So you're going to, Jace. You have to be very careful because my definition of womanhood is that they are women, strange creatures. Yeah. When you begin to run with them, <laughs> I, like you ride around with them, Miss K goes with female <laughs> companions. Run with yeah. them. I'm not in the back seat. Well, I was the by myself. Seat. I was I, by I'm myself. off the premises. I <laughs> don't travel. You, I was by myself in a world that I was not familiar with. I walk in. I find a girl that works there, and I said, look, where is the paint section? And she looked bewildered. I said, okay, I'm looking. My daughter is looking for paint by number. She said, oh, I figured it'd be in the paint section. But she said, go down <laughs> all the way down the end of this aisle, which was the east side of the building, and take a right. And she said, go down till you see the glitter section, and it's in there. <laughs> I didn't want to Have you ask, ever been to a glitter section before, Jay? I didn't want to. Uh, you, you, you're picking up on where... We lost communication because when you she said you run up on the road, glitter. The, the women, the women travel. You're, yeah. you're on a road that women, a horde, are going through, and you're down in there wandering around, saying, "Why?" I was too prideful to say, "What do you mean by glitter?" Yeah. So I just thought, surely she's acting like I'll know what this is. So I walk all the way down, and I took a right. There's, I would say, at least 50 aisles. And so I go, once I take the right, I go two aisles, and I look at something that I would define as glitter. So I started looking around. I, I see nothing about paints. So I said, well, must not have been. Well, I'll go two more. I'll, I see what I think is more glitter. And this kept continuing aisle by aisle. I thought, this whole place is full of, well, evidently, I don't know what glitter is. So I see an, an older African-American woman, and the only reason I stopped her is because she had her mask was a LSU Tiger mask. And uh, I said, excuse me, this is going to seem like a strange question, but what exactly is glitter? 
And she said, well, what <laughs> what are you looking for? I said, well, I'm looking for paint by numbers. The girl said, go down to the glitter section. I'm a quarter mile from that girl now. So I, <laughs> she's gone to me. Can you help me? You mean this is a big store? Phil, you would not believe it. It's the old uh, Walmart. It, yeah, it's as big as a it's Walmart. It's the old Walmart. Yeah, it's big. Filled right. with glitter. And she said, well, I think what you need to do is go all the way to the end, and that's where the paint by numbers. But she's like, I don't know what she meant by the glitter because there's glitter everywhere. So I, that validated my assessment. <laughs> so then I get all the way down. I never noticed this is different glitter than anything else I've walked by the last quarter mile. So then I thought, I'm now in the section, but I can't. I still can't find it. So I thought, well, I'll call. I hated to do it, but I was like, I got I to gotta call Missy. So I call her. Well, then she <laughs> calls me back while we're talking with the FaceTime, which I didn't even know you could do that. So I answer it, but it was her. But now she's seeing me, and I'm seeing her. So now I'm trying to tell the story about the glitter, and she's getting frustrated. And so I'm showing her, I thought you'd like this, because now she's looking at what I'm looking at. And she's like right there, and it was. So she's shopping She's shopping through you now. Yeah. Because literally she's doing the shopping, but you're just a vehicle. Jace. Just a when body you, next bag. Next time you get in there, run from there. <laughs> you, you're in a woman's world. So Man, I, you, 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 you're on the wrong road, son. So I finally we found it. Then I had to go each box to see. Look, there were hundreds of paint by number boxes. So I'm glad I called. So I get two things she like, she likes, and then I go back to that counter, and same girl. I said, look. I, I got what I came for. I mean, it's been 30 minutes. I said, remember me? And she, well, of course you remember me because number one, I was the only male in the store. I had camouflage. There you yep. go. And That's what I'm saying. And the only thing she can see is the whiskers coming out from under my mask. And she said, yeah. I said, all right, look, I want to give you a tip. You know, when you say the glitter section, I said to somebody like me, this whole store is filled with glitter. I said, that was not really good directions. And she just, nothing. So I thought, okay, I'll try to help her. <laughs> here's my money. I went, well, everybody's happy. Well, here's one, here was one interesting thing before we leave the Hobby Lobby topic. So we're getting the tour by the Greens who started Hobby Lobby, which they're an amazing spiritual family, great Christian people, basically started it in, a, in their garage just by building picture frames. That's where Hobby Lobby, which is now a multi-billion dollar corporation. I didn't even know And they've know done this. all kind of great things for the kingdom. Oh, they're amazing. So one of the greens, that may have been David, t told dad, he said, they, he said, come over here, Phil. I want to show you a concept that we're working on because obviously we mainly cater to females. They said, but, you know, we would, we would love to figure out how to try to get some men into our store. And so they had this little section and they were calling it the man cave and it had more male oriented type stuff. And there in the middle of it was a little book section and there was dad's face. Dad, do you remember this? Your, your, your books were like on a little rack in so. the man cave. Yeah. Oh yeah. So. And so, well, so course, I didn't know that was like, there. look, but there's me. Well, that's yeah. incredible. Well, well so I guess they were selling my, were they selling my books? I guess they were. Yeah, they said they were set on your books in their stores, you which go. is really cool because they don't normally do that. All right, let's take a break. So it's good to hear from our old friends at Black Rifle Coffee Company. We hadn't talked about them in a while. Uh, one of our great sponsors we've had a long time. It's a veteran owned uh, company. Uh, their founder spent over seven years on the grounds with U.S. Special Forces and as a CIA contractor. So this guy, he, Dad, he even made a way, found a way to grind coffee in his gun truck. I mean, that's how committed he was to good coffee. You know, while he was serving overseas, serving our country. You gotta, you gotta have it. Yeah, you got, you, you gotta, gotta have it. it. So they've donated over 6 million cups of coffee to both deployed soldiers as well as law enforcement and even medical workers. Uh, it's called buy a bag, give a bag. So they just do a lot of really good things for our military and uh, first responders. So we like supporting these guys. They got a brand new product uh, at the Black Rifle Coffee Club. 
and it's a ready to drink coffee in a can. So if folks that are interested in that, be sure and check that out. So here's what you want to do. Uh, you want to go to blackriflecoffee.com slash fill. Use the promo code fill for 20% off your first purchase. And so that's the coffee club. Any of the coffee purchases, blackriflecoffee.com slash fill. Use the code fill 20% off. Make your mornings better with Black Rifle Coffee. I said all that to say this, you know, life can be tough navigating with, you know, your wife or your wife. Cause she, when I told her the story, she's like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And look, she was right because the next day when I was driving down I 20, I looked to my left and there is a sign that you should never miss that says hobby lobby. It's huge. I'm like, how in the world? <laughs> <laughs> Did I not see that? So that was embarrassing. I'll give her credit for that. However, you know, what you think about what makes life great, especially when you're in Jesus together, because I think I'm so proud of my wife for, you know, being on a, you know, a news show talking about stories in the Bible. But she sent me a, a blog that she does. And I was like, well, where can I read this? And she's like, missyrobertson.com. I said, well, how in the <laughs> world did you pull that off? She's like, it took about two minutes. <laughs> well, maybe I need a jacerobertson.com. I, was, <laughs> I don't know. That, I, that was incredible that she has a website with her name. I, all right, maybe I'm thinking too small. But what I read, look, my wife's done a lot of articles and, and stories, and she's – She's amazing. But she did one that she sent me, you know, while I was on the on my trip to Kentucky. And it was it was called uh The Willful Walk That Saved You and Me. And what she's doing, Al, I think you'll you'll find this interesting. Cause we have Easter coming up. And she's doing a study every day leading up to Easter Sunday. And so she started this in John 12 where Jesus was having this meal and it says they were reclining at the table and I'll let you read it. You know, if you want, you go to Missy Robertson.com and she'll take you all the way there. But what I found fascinating about this, she took our situation with Mia because by far the most painful part of our role in dealing with a daughter with special needs is that handoff when you hand your daughter off and you walk away it's just or you can look at it when we walk to hand her off either one it's just you're overcome with emotion every, every time and i thought it would be easier once my daughter got older nope you're like i know what's fixed to happen is going to be a lot of suffering but you're willfully doing it because you know for the greater good well, she took that moment and then went to Jesus's moment here where he's reclining with his friends and family, knowing that he's going to get up and walk eventually getting to a donkey, riding on the donkey leading to the walk to the cross. Well, I'm telling you, it was, uh, I t I, when I read it, I was like 10 out of 10 spectacular. I was, I was moved by that way. By the way, I looked at, uh, looked it up this morning for some reason and uh i just wanted to know how far back the uh, world book encyclopedia would put uh good friday i said i yeah. wonder i wonder if they record but they went back they said tr you can trace it back to the first century a.d al first century a.d oh is that right oh yeah it can be so tracked the so celebration. <laughs> first, it was more kind of like a fasting, the Good Friday, but then it turned out they said it's as it moved along. By the time it got to 300 A.D., uh, it was more of a, a much more of a celebration on what we now do with Good Friday. But yeah. but it did go back to the first century, 100 A.D. That struck me as wow. it, it, it screamed out at me for good reason. It was there. Because yeah. he was there. It's 2000, 
2,000 years of tradition. Yep. And as Jay said, you know, uh, this really the whole week, I love what Missy's doing because, you know, a lot of people will call this Passion Week uh, that we're recording in. And this uh, this episode is is coming out on Good Friday. And, you know, it starts, Jay, so you talked about those palm limbs, which were laid down, you know, the, the week prior when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, which I think you can find in almost every gospel. And then, of course, you read about it in, uh, in John 12. And uh, the idea was, is that he was being hailed as the Messiah. I mean, as the king of Israel. And that's how the week starts. But you think about it, what happened in that week from one Sunday to the next. Of course, you, you come along in the week and Good Friday, of course, celebrates the day that he died. But this was, you know, this was the biggest week in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's fair to say, right? Yeah, oh, no doubt about it. Well, what I liked about what she did was she kind of looked at it from their perspective in that you think about all the comforting moments we have. And really, our whole TV show was based on at the end of the day, no matter what happens, we're going to gather up and have a meal and love each other and, and laugh together, sometimes cry together, whatever. But we're coming together. And for those, his friends that were there that night, they had no idea what was fixing to happen. But Jesus did. And to be yeah. in that setting knowing, you know, this is it. This is going to be, as far as my humanity on the earth, before what's fixing to happen, She's like, it must have been, I mean, you know, I had to cross his mind of, of the enjoyment that he had in that process, but to have to get up and leave it for the greater good, which is a, the greatest good, which is our eternal destiny, the eternal destiny of all humans. It was a powerful moment and it was well thought out. And the point she made about all this opposition from religious leaders and you know, Jesus is disdain. And when you look at the people he's reclining with, all these people had checkered past. They were considered riffraff. You know, she had a little, a little snide at me about, she knows what commercial fishermen smell like. I mean, it just didn't <laughs> seem like, you know, the king of the earth from heaven, Jesus riding on a donkey reclining with the riffraff. It what's, just it just didn't seem like this what's is What's interesting this was him. about Easter week, I've noticed, being a commercial fisherman, uh it's the it's the last that week is let's put it this way, it's the beginning of warmth, budding leaves. Mm. Uh, it, it, it's the beginning of spring officially. It's always cool, yep. pretty cool during Easter. You haven't noticed that, out? The week of Easter is always yep. cool. It's pretty cool out there today. And then it, after four or five days, it just it all warms up, and the spring is in full, full bloom. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. It, it really is. I told Misty the other night, she was like, I wanted to catch her some fish, which I, I did acquire them eventually from Jay. But she's like, boy, that would be so good. I was like, yeah, but, you know, they don't bite before Easter. And she's like, well, that's the most ridiculous thing. They don't know it's Correct. Easter. I was like, babe, I'm just telling you from years. <laughs> they know. I said from years. And she's like, they just, <laughs> they the date changes every year. And that job was like, babe, I don't know what to tell you. They're not biting <laughs> before Easter. And so the I big, went over to Willie's pond. You know what I, would, you know what I mean? I called zero. I the, said the big run with nets and all of that. You say the big run just after Easter, just after it's the beginning, just yep. after Easter, Easter on, Easter on. I saw it every year. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean you can't catch a couple, but as a general rule. Something similar is, is Granny and Paul, you would always tell me, there was always be a cool snap the week of Easter. That's right. And so when they said, so when they said that, you know, first I was, you know, I'm a kid, you know, so I just, uh, whatever. But then I started looking at, for it and they were right every year. <laughs> every and, year. and Missy's right. The date moves around, actually, but the week of Easter, there's always a cool snap. I mean, it's it just was actually it's, pretty cool last night when I got out, I was like, oh, week of Easter. Yep. That's right. And, and we've yeah. actually got a fairly early Easter this year. Let's take another yeah. break.
Well, I think the concept too of dad to make that concept even further. The idea that in next next time we'll talk about you know the resurrection more, but that you know Paul puts out the idea in First Corinthians fifteen that something has to die for there to be life. And he, he uses illustrations from you. He talks about a kernel of wheat goes into the ground and then what springs out of it. And so that concept we see in nature, which God, of course, is nature. He created it, is that idea that something will appear to be dead to us, but then through a growing cycle, produce more and better from what went into the ground, which I think is really interesting. And so that's that idea that without death you really don't have life i mean it's just kind of that circle and that cycle that keeps going yeah and that's i think that's what the reminder is things die on the planet and seeds are planted and then things come back over and over and over you see it you see it you see it and i i think it was god's way of of preparing your heart for when you hear jesus and the idea of us being resurrected it's not a foreign concept because we see on this earth we're surrounded by death and spring and life and this the creation we just take it for granted i mean they can call it you know photosynthesis in the educational world but when you start trying to replicate these things of of creating matter or you know regenerating something that's dead well it becomes a little more difficult the mayhaw trees in my yard i've been monitoring them especially now the last couple of days and I'm looking, and I'm seeing the new mayhaws forming on all those limbs, Al. But you don't see them till about Easter. And then you begin mm-hmm. to see them. They blossom out. Then you see the little mayhaws. Right now the mayhaws are small, but uh, we'll be picking them up in May. The last, we'll be picking them up just shortly. See what I'm saying? Won't yeah. be long now, three, four weeks. And they only have, what, about a week or two cycle where That's you can it. actually – where they fall off the tree. Yep. I mean, that's it. That's yep. the only time you're going to get that's them. That's why they call them May for the whole year. It's, it's after Easter that you really begin to see them. Yep. So a lot of things start about Easter time. New life. Yeah. Got May Hall jelly coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I think in this story, you know, too, when, and the reason I was saying, you know, the differences in, you know, men and women and, and just the battle in our marriages and, and, you know, going back to the Hobby Lobby story, you know, being out of my element, you know, all these other guys at reclining around that table and his closest friends, you would think that they would be getting the big picture, but it was Mary, the one who had put two and two together and realized he's fixing a head, head to a death for us, you know, and she takes out the perfume and, you know, pours it on him. And then remember Judas like, what are you doing? We could have sold that made money. And, and Jesus chastised and rebuked because somehow another, which I really don't even understand. And it really doesn't say, but she had figured out, Oh, this is the son of God. And he's fixed to give his life for us, which is incredible, which is why I'm bringing this up. Different people from different perspectives have insight into things that sometimes you have to stop and say, make sure I'm not missing something here in the, in the grand scheme. I mean, I think we tend to look at our differences and the battle that's in there. But a lot of times, even like, look, I don't know why I was surprised when I read my wife's blog, but I was like, wow. I mean, I, I was shocked that it was so good. I mean, I'm like, well, she didn't even tell me this is what she was thinking. She just sat down and wrote it as as an inspiration to others. But, I mean, it was shockingly good. Which is which is a good reason why we should have spiritual conversations and prayer with our spouses because yep. a lot of times you don't know what they're thinking about spiritually unless you have a conversation yeah. about it and they tell you what they're thinking or they tell you how God's working in their life. A lot of people, that's why the power of praying together. You know, I, I always encourage young couples – you know, pray together, spend some time because you, you need the other needs to hear what you're thinking in your spirit because nobody really does. That's just kind of a place between you and the almighty. Yeah. Which is powerful. Yeah. Sure. But Jason, you know, I thought about that. So John 11 is interesting, but going back another step before he got there on his way, when he winds up stopping at Bethany, you remember he lingered. I mean, he knew Lazarus was sick. 
and they got the word, and they were like, you got to hurry up and get here because he's going to die. One is you're not going to get to see him because they were super close. And two is you could, you could, you know, keep him from dying. He does all these miracles. And Jesus lingered two extra days wherever he was so that Lazarus would die. Mm-hmm. And I've always found that fascinating because, and look, it, you know, he, he was hurt that he was even dead because remember he wept, even knowing he was about to raise him up. But all that had a purpose to show us that you have to die to live. And you mentioned it last podcast about baptism being a symbol of that, the idea of surrender and being put to death and then coming to new life. But even at the end of this life, until the Lord comes back, you don't live forever until you die here. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's the way that God created us. And so I think Jesus has shown that consistently throughout all of his ministry. And I found that fascinating that even one of his best friends, he allowed him to physically die to show that you could be raised back to life. Unless the seed dies, that's just one single seed. It can't make others. It yeah, where's that at? Yeah. I was thinking of the same verse. Yeah. Uh, Remember the, the in that first Corinthians fifteen? Well, no, it's, no, in, it's John. in it's in it's in Or did John. Jesus say it? Yeah, it's in John. He he says, Unless a kernel falls to the ground. Yep. Uh oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's that at? It's on the left hand oh, side. Oh, it, it's in John twelve, duh. Yeah. It's right past where we just got through reading. Yeah, in 23, he said, because he said the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves, which goes to your point, Al, the man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this life in this world will keep it for eternal life. For whoever serves me must follow me and where I am my servant also will be. Yeah, that's that's right. And you remember uh you remember when we went and saw the passion when it came out the movie the church rented the whole theater and we went and watched it together. Do yes. y'all remember that? Yes. Seeing that, that is one yeah. of the few things so, I'll you know, forget. It, so it's funny cuz somebody said they wasn't able to make it that night. It just this struck me, and I thought about this in real time that we're studying. They said, "Well, did y'all, you know, watch the Passion?" I said, "Yeah," and they were like, well, "Was it good? Like, like you would for any movie, right? Was it good?" Yeah. And I didn't know how to answer that question. I was like, "Well, I'll never forget it. It was amazing. It saved our lives. I mean, I think everybody should see it, no matter what. I, I don't know that I can call it good. It was so, you know, brutally." depicted as what we read in the scriptures, which I think it was fantastic the way Gibson did it. Yep. But is it good? You know, I thought about that question because, man, it was it was so hard and just just to witness it, you know, it, with a big screen deal, all the things we had read about our whole lives. But it was it, it is good in the sense that it had to happen for us to live. But, man, to just to read about it, to watch it now because of that, it's it's a tough watch. It was sobering. Yeah, so that's how I felt. People were crying. Yeah, I remember people crying around me. Yep. You know, just just the realities of it about what he went through on that fateful day, mm-hmm. and and to Jason's point, and I guess Missy's point through the blog, it started out so beautiful right before. I mean, his time with his disciples, the washing of the feet, the triumphal entry, and yet it turned so quickly into what it had to be. You know, yep. what it was, what it was basically prophesied to be. Hey, let's take a let's take a break. I said the same thing when people ask me. I'd say no, it's not good because you have to look at what <laughs> caused him to take that walk, you know, to a cross, which was basically our sin. And I mean, you can say the sin of the Correct. world, not personalize it, but I think when you personalize it, that's what moves you, and and everyone has to go through that process because you're basically guilty of causing this to happen, which goes to the other point. His pursuit of us is way greater than our pursuit of him will ever be. He, Cause he has the ultimate, his love is perfect. And, and ours is not. That's why I like it later on in John 12, when, you know, they had the voice come and he said, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself, which I literally think that means when the cross was lifted up with him on it, 
not the resurrection, because it says he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. I mean, what a, oh, what a way to, Ooh. to phrase that saying when I'm lifted up. Because we always would think that that was some kind of honorable thing, but he was like, "I'm doing this to save you," you know. We well, remember there are several verses <clears throat> that say, "When the time was set, when the time had fully come." So it wasn't an accident that it was in the first century where the style of execution at the time from the Romans was one of the most brutal things that mankind has ever come up with to execute people. And look, there's been a lot of people come up with a lot of gruesome stuff. You go over and look around in the tower of London to see what some of the Brits came up with. I mean, they're pretty brutal too, Mm -hmm. but this particular way of doing it was something. And that's the time when he said he was going to come. And because so much is happening at the cross. I mean, it's, you know, God is fulfilling all prophecy there through Jesus. The law is being completed and fulfilled there. You know, I love that at the end of Hebrews 11, where the Hebrew writer lists all those great Jews of old. And he said in verse 39, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us, would they be made perfect? And then we know from later in chapter 12, what he was talking about. It took the cross to cleanse the sins of everybody that had ever lived up until the moment of the cross. And then now going forward to cover the sins of any that, you know, call on Christ. So, I mean, that was a, that event cascaded in time in two directions Mm -hmm. to make everyone perfect who had a faithful heart to God. And I think what's interesting is that he actually accomplished it in a bit of secrecy, because when you read Paul's letter to the Corinthians in the first letter, in 1 Corinthians 2, after he said, think about what you were when you were called. You weren't wise by human standards. There's no scholars. You were weak, which is the same type of crew that he was with back in John, just the riffraff. And he gets down to chapter 2 in in Corinthians in verse 7. It says, we speak of God's secret wisdom a wisdom that has been hidden and that god destined for our glory before even time began none of the rulers of this age understood it for if they had they would not have crucified the lord of glory and then he quotes isaiah where it says however it is written no eye has seen no ear has heard no mind has conceived what god has prepared for those who love him but god has revealed it to us by his spirit So I read that. It made me think back to that John chapter seven, which we covered it when we went through John. But here recently, I've been thinking more about it where you remember where his brothers came to him and and it said they didn't even believe in him in John seven, five. And they're like, well, what are you doing? Nobody who wants to be a public figure goes around and operates in secret because they were all fixed to go to that feast, which I thought, how dumb does that look now? You're giving terrible advice to the creator of the universe in in human form. And so then he's like, yeah, okay, appreciate the tip. And he didn't say it like that. but And then as soon as they left, (laughs) he left. He kept operating in in secret. And then they're all at the feast. And then he gets up. But the backdrop of that were all these secret conversations happening by the Pharisees and all saying, who is this guy? Everybody was murmuring. The whole chapter is about secrets. You have Jesus doing this, which we know why, because they wouldn't have crucified him, the spiritual forces of evil and the authorities, if they would have known by this, it dooms them and saves the riffraff. And he's also you know, going on this principle that God who sees what is done in secret, you know, remember the sermon on the Mount is going. And what I found fascinating about, I said all this, say this at the end of chapter seven, uh, after all this, nobody who wants to be a public figure acts in secret. Well, then here comes Nicodemus who's taken up for Jesus in secret. He's the same guy who approached Jesus in John three. Remember In secret, saying, you know what the kicker is? Jesus going to the cross, dying, being resurrected, is the the solving of completely of the totality of men's sin 
and their death. He did it in 72 hours, Al. Solved yeah. the whole thing. <laughs> your sin problem, yep. your grave problem, 72 hours. Yeah. That's how long it took, it took God to, <laughs> to, to complete that. Is that amazing or what? Well, yeah. Can and, you imagine a yeah. government that would do something even close to that and they're saving the world from all and all the government remedies that have come along and gone? You're like, he solved the world's problems, especially the removal of the penalty of sin and the resurrection. 72 yeah. hours? You're like, how in the world? Well, Phil, and to, and to finish my thought with that in mind, you really think about a lot of us, we go public, you know, for Christ. When you declare, I, I believe Jesus is going to be the Lord of my life. But really what leads to that are these secret moments inside your soul and heart that's not spoken. When you're reflecting on that and you believe that that's real, that's where the real spiritual forces of evil at work in your life are, you know, subsided. Yep. Because these these unseen <clears throat> moments, because a lot of us struggle with living one way publicly or showing everybody, oh, 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 and then deep down in their heart and soul, it's a mess. And I and, wonder what the world would look like without Jesus. <laughs> Think about it, Al. Let's take one quick. Let's take a quick break. Oh man, and, and you know what's interesting, Dad, is that. You think about symbols, you know, we talk about different symbols, things that symbolize one thing early on, you know, because the the church even was even though they were growing like wildfire in the book of Acts, you know, they were having to do a lot of it underground and secret and on the run and because they would have these different persecutions. And so the early symbol for Christianity was a fish. They would draw a fish. Because, mm-hmm. you know, the I guess the idea of fishers of men and, and, the, and of course, all the fishermen that were disciples. And so the fish was the symbol like, oh, OK, this guy, he knows, you know, he knows what's going on. I don't know when. Maybe you can check that down in your in your world book encyclopedias. But sometime it shifted over to where the cross itself became the symbol. And even to this day, we see that if you if you were to ask somebody, what's the symbol for you know Christianity, especially on Good Friday, what would it be? And anybody would tell you, well, it'd be a cross because you know they're all over the place. I, you guys don't travel much, so you probably hadn't seen it. But you go twenty miles east on I twenty, somebody in Ravel has put up about a two hundred foot cross. Yeah, I've seen it right on I twenty. Yeah, and, and I mean it, it looms, doesn't yeah, it, Jay? You can he, see it, it for miles it, on either side huge. of it. Yeah, I love it. And at night it's it's lit up and I love it because it's like somebody said, you know what, anybody that drives by Rabel, Louisiana, you're gonna know huh. that there's a cross that represents Jesus. Which I think, you know, but it makes it, you it, reflect it, it's so much more. Yeah, it makes you reflect in your own heart. And the reality of that and that that movie we talked about, The Passion, gives you the visual image of it, which I think is important. And but that yep. those you know, I said a lot about those secret moments. You know, when he made that analogy in Matthew 6, it says three different times about when you give and when you pray and when you fast. He had this slogan three different times. It says, your father who sees what is done in secret. And and his brothers, the reason they were giving him terrible advice is because they were looking at the symbolic images of everything it from a political narrative, from a religious thing. And even we're talking about a cross in Ravel. Does that physically mean anything? No, but it causes people to go back a couple thousand years ago and then, and then look at their own life on what led that walk to salvation for their mistakes. And all of a sudden you have some secrecy going on where God is moving. And I think there's something to that. And the reason I'm stressing this is because here this Nicodemus, when Jesus dies and is buried, well, who is the one secretly going to check on his body? The same fella who, where this all started off. I think at first it started that he was embarrassed to be seen with Jesus. And now he's taking huge risks because his heart had been just like ours and you think about what we do in our life look 
that letter to the Corinthians where we read about none of the rulers understood it or they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. He began that saying the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. They see a cross going through Ravel and they say, that's a dumb, you don't want to waste of time and space. But to us who are being saved, oh, it's the power of God. Because to them, it's just a symbol. And to us, it goes to a reality that we believe is true. And again, I think the nature of how bad it was is is also a reminder to us uh, when we endure things. And, you know, back to Hebrews 12, the Hebrew writer basically said that. He said, you know, consider the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus, you know, let us fix our eyes on him, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne. He said, consider him who endured such an opposition so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So you've said it before, Dad, many times. I've heard you say it when somebody says something about being persecuted, and you're like, well, look what they did to Jesus. And I think that's what takes you back there every time. The cross was so brutal because it had to be in its nature because of sin, but it also gives us the ability to say, you know what? Because somebody's talking bad about me on Twitter is really not a big deal <laughs> compared to what Jesus went through. Well, right. You know, you just to it. keep it in the proper perspective. <laughs> but Al, I think it's also what you made the point about when you watch the passion and somebody said, is it good? We do the same thing by calling it good Friday. Well, is it good? Not, not completely because what had to happen right. to save it. So we're like, eh? yeah, it is good because God's <laughs> grace won. But we also have yep. to look at it from an accountability standpoint that if you believe that God did that for us and we do, then you also should feel a little uh, about some of the things you've done and it, and that's okay. I think that's, that's healthy. I think another picture of that Jay, uh, is about is in communion because basically we talk about it being a celebration of what Jesus did, you know, by giving himself for us. And it's in that kind of meal setting. And of course, it's a lot more ritualized now than it was in the first century. But at the same time, you can't help but self-reflect and look at yourself during that time of communion and say, man, I mean, Jesus did so much for me. I, I really need to think about what I'm doing, where I'm going. Am I glorifying him? So it's a double. I, I can't just be celebratory in communion, I'm always more reflecting about what Jesus did and gave up too. I mean, it's just a, to me, it's like a two edged sword. Yeah. And, and again, it goes back to the, the number one principle, how he died, which is what we focus on, on this day was terrible, but who died is way more important. Yeah. I mean, there's been other people die on a cross. There's probably been other people. You can think of a worse way to die. I mean, not saying a cross is a, a good one, but of all the schemes of, uh, around humanity, I'm sure they've come up with, you know, some of Jesus' followers were skinned alive and thrown into boiling oil. And, I mean, the evil schemes come up with different ways to die. But who Jesus is, being innocent, doing this on purpose, knowing this is the way to save us out of love, coupled with the fact that it was a, you know, a government execution pretty much led all of a sudden you got, well, you talked to the recipe for something awesome. You talked about that, the kind of the secrecy of it. And th again, this is something you don't necessarily read in scripture, but a, a movie maker could capture. You remember the scene when Jesus dies and it's like a raindrop comes down out of heaven, but it, it hits the dirt. Like, almost like a tear of God, you know? And then at that exact moment, they show the person, the being that had been depicted as Satan in the garden, you know, with Jesus, kind of a snaky looking person. I, I don't know. They were real weird looking mm -hmm. character that was displaying Satan. And this, this being of Satan just screams out like in terror at the moment Jesus dies. And I've always thought that was pretty fascinating. I don't yeah. know how, what really happened, but what a great imagination to think that in the moment Jesus died, Satan thought, oh, no, well, right. that's why he came here. Everything got dark. You know, like that it, control. It, it all got dark. Well, pretty well lights it, out. Yeah, you know while. what? In that moment, it was. my wife and I are completely the same. She's made mistakes. I've made mistakes. 
and this is what it took to forgive us. And look, that's everybody on the planet, no matter where you came from, your creed, your color, your mistake. And in the history of the world, we all came together in in a moment. And I think that's the power of the cross. I will. I'll close out by saying um, to our audience because I know we got a lot of young people in the audience, and the passion's been around a few years. And so you may not have watched it yet, but go rent it, download it, go to Fox Nation. They're live streaming it. Find it and watch it if you never have, and you'll understand exactly what we're talking about. I highly recommend that you do that. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.